Now let's look at what happens for diagonalizable matrices. So first of all, we have the following fact, which is that suppose A is a matrix that is diagonalizable, okay, with A equal to S lambda S inverse and lambda being a diagonal matrix. And suppose E um, is a perturbation matrix of size n cross n. Now, if lambda hat is an eigenvalue of A plus E, then there is some eigenvalue lambda I of A for which this difference between lambda hat minus lambda I is at most the L infinity norm of S times the L infinity norm of S inverse times the L infinite on infinity norm of E, which uh, as we defined it earlier is K infinity of S times the L infinity norm of E. So K infinity of S is the condition number of S under the L infinity norm. So we see the condition number showing up in when we try to analyze the stability of eigenvalue computations. But what matters here in the case of diagonal mat diagonalizable matrices is the condition number of S, which is the matrix that diagonalizes A, not the condition number of A itself. Um, of course, we know that A plus E and S inverse A plus E times S have the same eigenvalues and S inverse A plus E times S is nothing but lambda plus S inverse E times S. Now, lambda is a diagonal matrix, and so by the Gershkorn's theorem, there is some eigenvalue lambda i such that if lambda hat is an eigenvalue of a plus e, then there is an eigen there is some lambda i such that lambda hat minus lambda i is at most s inverse e s the L infinity norm. And now the result follows from the submultiplicativity property property of the matrix norm. That's it. We can actually extend this result to a more general class of norms, which are norms satisfying this property that the norm of D is equal to the maximum diagonal entry when the matrix D is diagonal. Okay, some examples of such norms are the L1 norm, L2 norm, and L infinity norm. Okay, so the, this is the extension. So suppose A is a diagonalizable matrix of size n cross n, and A can be written as S lambda S inverse, where lambda is a diagonal matrix containing the eigenvalues of A on the diagonal. And let E be a perturbation matrix of size N cross N, and let this norm be a matrix norm, such that norm of D equals the maximum diagonal entry for all diagonal matrices. If lambda hat is an eigenvalue of A plus E, then there is some eigenvalue lambda i f of a such that lambda hat minus lambda i magnitude is at most k of s times the norm of e, this, this norm of e, where k is the condition number with respect to this particular matrix norm. So let's, um, let's, let's see how to show this. Okay, so a uh, starting point is the same as that of the previous result. Obviously, S inverse A plus E times S is equal to lambda plus S inverse E S. Now, if uh, lambda hat is an eigenvalue of lambda plus S inverse ES, then what we know is that if I take lambda hat times the identity matrix minus lambda minus S inverse ES, okay, what can I say about this matrix? Correct. So basically, uh, eigenvalues satisfy the determinant of lambda i minus a equal to zero, and so lambda hat i minus this, that determinant is equal to zero, so this matrix itself is singular, okay? Now, if this matrix itself is singular, 
This means that lambda hat equals lambda i for some i. And then there's nothing to prove. That is, this inequality will be anyway satisfied. Okay. But if, uh, so, so I think we can safely assume that lambda hat is not equal to lambda i for any i so that lambda hat i minus lambda is non-singular. Okay. Then I'll consider the matrix lambda hat i minus lambda inverse times lambda hat i minus lambda lambda minus s inverse es okay and then i'll just expand this out this is oops the identity matrix minus um, lambda hat i minus lambda inverse times s inverse e s. Okay. So this matrix is singular. Okay. Now recall a result we showed a long time ago which is that a in C to the N cross N is invertible if there is a matrix norm such that norm of I minus A is less than 1. Okay. So what that means is that if, if this matrix is singular, no matter which norm I consider, the norm of I minus this matrix should be greater than one. Okay. So I'll just write that here, implies norm of um, I minus A is greater than one for every norm, for any norm. If A is singular. Okay, by the way, how did we show this result? Just to recall, um, if norm of I minus A is less than one, then we considered the series. K equal to zero to infinity, I minus A power K. This converges to C because the radius of convergence of uh, uh, summation z power k is is one. Then what we do is we look at um, a times sigma say k equal to zero to n i minus a power k, and this is equal to we write this as i minus i minus a times sigma k equal to 0 to n i minus a power k. And when you expand this out, it becomes a telescoping sum. And you're left with only the first and last terms, which is i minus i minus a power n plus 1. And this goes to the identity matrix as n goes to infinity because the spectral radius of this is less than one. 
and so um, or rather this matrix converges to the all zero matrix and so we conclude that uh, basically this matrix what whatever this converges to is the matrix a inverse and a is actually i should write it the other way a is invertible and c equals a inverse okay this was just an aside to recall how this goes but now we'll come back to our the proof we are trying to write out so we'll apply this uh, uh, this result and uh, that is to be applied to the matrix i minus lambda hat i minus capital lambda inverse times s inverse es and so i minus that matrix is um uh, so if I I minus that matrix is just lambda hat minus I uh, lambda hat. So okay. So so thus um, I minus lambda hat I minus lambda inverse S inverse E S singular implies. I minus this matrix, which is lambda hat I minus lambda inverse S inverse E S norm is greater than or equal to one. It doesn't matter which norm I pick. And so we have that one is less than or equal to this norm. Actually, what I'll do is I'll simplify this a bit and write it in this way. One is less than or equal to this, which I'll use my sub multiplicativity and write it as norm of S inverse E S times the norm of lambda hat I minus lambda inverse. And now I'll use the property that this norm it returns the largest diagonal entry whenever the matrix is diagonal and this is a diagonal matrix so that uh, so that this thing is actually equal to the right hand side here is equal to norm of s inverse es times the max 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n of mod lambda hat minus lambda i inverse it's the largest eigenvalue uh, I, a largest uh, magnitude diagonal entry which i can also write as norm of s inverse es divided by min one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n of mod lambda hat minus lambda i So we have uh, min one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n mod lambda hat minus lambda. I'm just taking this to the other side. So one is over here and that multiplied by this just gives me this is less than or equal to the norm of S inverse ES. Again, sub multiplicativity S S inverse norm of E, which is actually equal to K of E, K of S times norm of E, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so what we have done is that we have shown the importance of uh, the condition number with respect to solving, um, uh, finding eigenvalues of the matrix. But there is an important difference between what we saw just now and what we saw earlier when we were looking at the importance of the condition number in solving linear systems of equations. So when you're solving AX equals B, 
It is the condition number of A, K of A that matter. Here it is the condition number of S, K of S that matters, not K of A directly. Of course, S depends on A. S is the matrix that diagonalizes this matrix A. But it is K of S that matters, not K of A directly. Uh, so therefore, if K of S is a small number, then small changes in A lead to small changes in the eigenvalues. But if K of S is large, then small changes in A could lead to large changes in the eigenvalues. In particular, if S is unitary, then the condition number of S is equal to 1 with respect to the spectral norm. And in this case, the eigenvalues of A are actually well conditioned because K of S equals 1. And also recall that a matrix A can be unitarily diagonalized if and only if it is a normal matrix. Okay, so we conclude that So I'll just write it this way, normal matrices can be unitarily diagonalized and second point is that unitary matrices have and write okay condition number equal to 1 with respect to spectral norm okay which implies that Normal matrices are perfectly conditioned are perfectly conditioned uh, with respect to eigenvalue computation. Okay, so we have the following corollary. So let A be in C to the N cross N, and it's a normal matrix with eigenvalues lambda 1 up to lambda N. And let E be an N cross N matrix. If lambda hat is an eigenvalue of a plus e then there is some eigenvalue lambda i of a for which lambda hat minus lambda i is less than or equal to norm e spectral norm. Okay. Now, in the case where um, a and a plus e are both Hermitian matrices, we can actually use Weyl's interlacing theorem to get an even better bound. So that's the next theorem. If A and E in C to the N cross N are Hermitian, are Hermitian matrices normal? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So if they are Hermitian, are normal matrices Hermitian? Can be. Need not be, correct. Okay, so if A and E are both Hermitian and lambda 1 less than or equal to lambda 2 lambda n are 
the ordered eigenvalues of A and lambda hat 1, lambda hat 2, lambda hat n are the ordered eigenvalues of A plus E, then lambda 1 of E less than or equal to lambda hat K minus lambda K less than or equal to lambda N of E and this is true for k equal to 1 to n and mod of lambda hat k minus lambda k is less than or equal to rho of e spectral radius which is equal to in this case because it's Hermitian the L2 norm of e. Okay, so basically, this is a this is a better bound compared to the bounds we've seen earlier because it's really comparing the k eigenvalue of a plus e with the k eigenvalue of a. So it's telling us which eigenvalue of a lambda hat k will be close to. Okay. So um, there are a couple of different paths I can take from here, and I was I'm yet to decide what I will cover in the remainder of this course. So I'd like to stop here for today and uh, I'll figure out what I want to do next and continue in the, uh, in the next class.